directors and tenures in Scotland than, than in the rest of the UK. And I think that's something that should be welcomed. Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Fergus Ewing on Scotland's energy future, achieving security of supply and a balanced energy mix. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Before I call the Minister, can I say to members that we're extremely tight for time all afternoon. I call on Fergus Ewing, about 10 minutes, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to update the Chamber on recent developments relating, relating to Longanet and their implications for the future of Scotland's electricity system. On Monday, National Grid announced its decision to award a contract for additional voltage support services in 2016-17 to SSE's Peterhead Power Station. I welcome the support for Peterhead. I understand SSE is now progressing investment that will allow the station to operate more efficiently and flexibly going forward. Peterhead is key to efforts to prove the viability of carbon capture and storage, a technology presenting officer with potential to unlock future low carbon thermal generation in Scotland. For Long Annet, however, National Grid's decision is negative. Scottish Power has stated that in all likelihood, it will be forced to close Long Annet prematurely in 2016. The consequences of this would be profound, both for direct and indirect employment, for Scottish coal production, for hopes of restoring former open cast sites, and ultimately for the balance and resilience of Scotland's electricity supply. Let me be clear, while the decision is one for the company to make, we in the Scottish Government are determined to continue to explore any options that may avert the premature closure of Long Annet. We believe the decision taken by National Grid and endorsed by the outgoing UK Government is flawed and it fails to take account of serious flaws in the UK electricity supply system. My foremost thoughts, presiding officer, are for the 270 direct employees at Longanet uh, and those affected within the related supply chain. This is a deeply worrying time for all of them whose livelihoods depend most heavily on Longanet. I met with the leader and deputy leader of Fife Council on the 4th of March and spoke again with Councillor David Ross earlier this week. We have agreed to work on a joint response. We will co-chair a meeting to coordinate our efforts, inviting input from Scottish Power, from workforce representatives and other key stakeholders. The Scottish Government-led Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, that's PACE, has contacted Scottish Power to outline the support on offer to affected employees. In addition, I will meet with representatives of the STUC and the Long Annet unions on Thursday. The government and all our partners will strain every sinew to secure the best possible outcomes for all of those affected and to mitigate the lo local and national economic impact if closure cannot be averted. The expected closure of Long Annet will be felt throughout the supply chain, particularly in the coal sector. The Scottish coal industry has put forward proposals to the UK government for restoration coal. This would introduce a carbon price support exemption for open cast coal sites, as well as addressing the environmental liabilities associated with unrestored open cast. Restoration coal has the potential to reduce Long Annet's running costs. The UK and Scottish governments are committed to further joint work to implement this proposal, and I've written to the UK Treasury Minister, Exchequer Secretary Priti Patel, urging swift action. I now turn to the consequences of National Grid's decision for the balance and resilience of Scotland's energy supply. A balanced mix of clean thermal generation progressively fitted with CCS operating alongside renewables is and always has been this government's objective. Scotland's comparative advantage in the generation of renewable electricity is huge, with 90% of the UK's hydro capacity, 25% of the EU's offshore wind and tidal power potential, and 10% of its wave power potential. Renewables now supply almost half of Scotland's electricity consumption. To ignore that massive resource, to squander that economic opportunity of a lifetime, would be utterly reckless. Some members opposite believe 
the development of renewables has harmed the prospects of thermal stations. Those arguments are false. They might have carried some credibility if we were in a situation of healthy oversupply, but, presiding officer, spare capacity in the GB system has fallen to as low as 2% by next winter. The fact that we are even debating Long Annett's future at exactly the point when the UK authorities have allowed energy security to dwindle so severely is a national scandal. The Scottish Government has pushed National Grid to explain in detail the consequences of Long Annett's closure for Scotland's energy security and Black Start planning. We are still to receive the full details despite two letters from the First Minister to the Prime Minister. I welcome National Grid's recent commitment to publish a dedicated capacity assessment for Scotland, but surely that assessment is something we should have had many years ago. We must reflect too on how we got to this point. The UK authorities have created an environment in which it is increasingly difficult to operate thermal plant in Scotland. Scotland exported 28% of the power we generated in 2013, and we want to continue delivering large amounts of electricity across these islands. But our ability to do so is undermined by a UK framework that penalises Scottish generators and discourages investment. The location-based transmission charging methodology introduced to Scotland in 2005 under a Labour UK government is the single and biggest and most pressing issue. There are, of course, other factors affecting the profitability of all coal-fired generation across Britain, but no other factor uniquely disadvantages Long Annett. With 12% of GB electricity generation, Scottish genera generators pay 35% of the charges. Long Annett alone pays over 40 million annually to connect to the grid, while similar stations in England and Wales pay much less or may even be paid to connect. We are told that locational grid charging is designed to discourage the siting of energy generation away from major population centres, yet it penalises Long Annett, which of course is close to the city of Edinburgh and all of central Scotland. Long Annett is charged £17.15 per kilowatt, whilst generators in Cornwall are paid £5.80 per kilowatt, and in Somerset, where Hinkley C will connect, they are paid £3.94 per kilowatt. So we come to the nub of the problem. Scotland has an established policy towards its electricity generation, one which recognises the need to maintain a balanced mix of generation. But our efforts are frustrated by the UK government's unwillingness to address Scottish issues properly. For example, the UK capacity market takes no account of location or flexibility provide by, provided by pumped storage. We no longer have a say over the revenue support for renewables under the contracts for different scheme, even for Scottish-based projects. Our ability to meet our renewables ambitions is severely restricted by the lack of clear and consistent commitments by the UK government under the levy control framework. And the UK government has refused to address industry concerns regarding degression rates under the hydro feed-in tariff. We have made some progress on securing a commitment for support for renewables on the Scottish islands but no firm resolution as yet. And transmission charging is inhibiting the construction of new high efficiency gas stations at, at, gas station at Kikenzi, which I consented in 2011, whilst also restricting the output at Peterhead. Clearly, on a wide range of issues, we remain at the mercy of decisions taken in Westminster over which this parliament and this government has no control. I am Scotland's energy minister, but energy policy remains largely a reserved matter. This lack of power over key decisions on energy policy should concern all political parties in Scotland and should prompt some deeper reflection on the future of our energy system. There will be opportunities to review the landscape for energy policy post-May, 
but our immediate priority, ideally supported by a show of unity across this chamber, must be to avert the premature closure of Long Abbott. The Minister will now take questions raised in his statement. I intend to allow around about 20 minutes for questions, after which we'll move on to next business. Members wish to ask a question of the Minister, should press the request speak button now, and I call Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, and I thank the Minister for an advanced copy of his statement. The Minister says he would like cross-party support for his immediate priority to avert the premature closure of Long Annet. Unfortunately, he has not told us how he intends to achieve that end. If Plan A was to lobby National Grid to award its voltage control contract for 2016-17 to Long Annet rather than to Peterhead, that Plan A clearly failed. But what is the Minister's Plan B? Mr Ewing has talked about the impact of locational charging on the transmission system. He will of course know that Peterhead is further north and also faces transmission charges at a higher scale. He has also known for years, and Iberdrola, who own Scottish Power, has known for years about transmission charges. Iberdrola clearly decided some time ago not to make the investment required for Long Island to conform to European regulatory requirements to stay open beyond 2020. That's a commercial decision which they're entitled to make, but the Minister has known about that too. So while he may wish to make wider points in the Chamber today, what the workforce at Long Island want to hear is whether there is a plan B, if so, what it is, and when he is going to share any such strategy with those most directly affected by this decision. The Minister has had years to work with other stakeholders on preparing for the time unabated coal generation at Long Annet would no longer be possible, albeit that time has now been brought forward. Can he tell us today what those plans are so that the workforce at Long Annet is not left in the dark any longer? Minister. Uh, presiding officer, the Scottish Government is determined to explore every opportunity to avert the premature closure of Long Annet. Uh, we are very pleased that in that regard we will be working alongside the Prospect Union, who also have urged that all politicians support this aim and carry out this work. Uh, Gary Graham of the Prospect Union said, we will be asking for all Scottish politicians to work together and politicians north and south of the border to work together to ensure that there is a future for Long Gannett. Councillor David Ross, to whom I alluded, the leader of Fife Council, with whom I have worked on many matters, uh, says we still believe there is a future, a sustainable future, in the long term for Long Gannett. Presenting officer, if the workforce representatives, if the local authority believe that we should work together across this chamber to seek to achieve that objective, then I do hope that the Labour Party will join in that campaign. Uh, Mr. Mr. MacDonald asked a reasonable point, well, what is the plan B? Well, the plan B is to persuade National Grid, who are in charge of systems operation, as those who heard their evidence recently in the EAT will well know, uh, to use their extensive powers and their enormous budget, which I believe is in the order of £1 billion, to make the re relatively modest commitment to Longanet that would be required to tackle the higher transmission costs with which they are burdened. Uh, and I do hope that uh, in that campaign, presiding officer, we will gain the clear support of the Labour Party. Moreover, we have an opportunity post-May with an incoming uh, administration in Westminster to take a different approach towards safeguarding energy security of supply in these islands. Uh, there are a wide range of expert commentators uh, and experts who have informed our view and given us their evidence, their evidence to the Scottish Government that believe that the assumptions that National Grid make about security of supply in the UK are extremely optimistic, extremely optimistic. Their winter statement, for example, assumes 90% uh, of uh, some thermal generation stations will continue to operate. Many of those who operate stations do not share that optimism, presiding officer. Moreover, uh, there is another imminent factor, which is that tech will be given up by many companies over the coming weeks. That means it is correct for there to be a reappraisal by National Grid. When I met with Mike Calview last Thursday in London, he confirmed that it is perfectly possible for other alternative arrangements to be made. 
there is absolutely not a shadow of doubt that it is perfectly possible uh, for Longanet to continue to do the excellent job for Scotland for several years yet. What is in doubt, presiding officer, is whether there is a clear cross-party consensus and political will to, uh, to set our common uh, weight behind that task. Martin Fraser. Can I thank the Minister for advanced uh, sight of his statement? As a Fife representative, I am very much aware of the impact that Longanet's early closure would have on the local economy. Our first priority must be to support those whose jobs are at risk, and I welcome the measures set out today in the Minister's statement. But we know from Scottish Power that transmission charges were not the only issue forcing the closure of Longanet. As Lewis MacDonald said, the Peterhead uh, station pays higher charges than Longanet, but there is no proposal to close it. And despite the Minister's assertions, it is beyond doubt that the over-provision of electricity supply in Scotland today has contributed to higher charges. What the current locational transmission system does is, is it that it protects consumers, particularly in the north of Scotland, from higher bills, while consumers in London and the South East pay more. So what exactly is the Scottish Government proposing as an alternative and how much more will Scottish consumers pay as a result? And doesn't this whole episode expose once again the utter failure of SNP energy policy? So they are anti-fracking, they are anti-nuclear, they are obsessed with wind power and as a result we face the loss of 55% of our generating capacity in eight years. Energy-rich Scotland will be importing power from England in order to keep the lights on. Surely now, in face of all this evidence, it's time for a new approach to energy from this government. Minister. Well, Mr Fraser said that he's based in Fife. Perhaps that's why he seems to be unaware that people who live further north in Scotland pay higher electricity bills, not lower, as he suggested. That will come as, a, as something of a surprise. Mr Fraser. That, some, that uh, will come as a surprise to those uh, who, uh, like ourselves, are working hard to reduce the burden of extra costs in the north of Scotland, a burden which exists, in, in case Mr Fraser doesn't know, substantially because the cost per head of distribution system is around £112, uh, far more than the transmission system. So I guess uh, if he checked his facts on that, we might, he might just arrive at better conclusions. Also, I'm disappointed with Mr Fraser because, you see, on the 17th of February, his view at that time was, as quoted on BBC Radio Scotland News Drive, with regarding to the transmission charges, the 40 million penalty for operating in Scotland was this. He said, this does discriminate against Longanet, and that is a matter of concern for me. And moreover, it dis disappoints me for a second reason, because Mr Fraser is never slow to challenge the Scottish Government when he feels that any other form of costs facing business are higher in north of the border than south. But for some strange reason, presiding officer, when it comes to electricity generation, and even when the facts clearly demonstrate that Longanet, uh, despite the shaking heads of the Conservatives, faces £40 million transmission charges, whereas coal-generating stations down in England get paid to contribute to the grid. They say nothing about it. Could that be because their bosses based in London don't allow them to stand up for Scotland? Is that it? Is that it, presiding officer? And perhaps, uh, perhaps Mr Fraser might want to reflect on public opinion in Scotland. 71% support wind uh, and nearly 10% support the Conservative Party. We have very little time this afternoon, so can I ask that the remaining questions are brief. Rob Gibson, followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, President Officer. Um, successive UK governments, the policy makers of the UK electricity market and the UK national grid pose a twin threat to my constituents and those all over Scotland, to energy producers and consumers, which is a double whammy. Uh, dearer grid access charges and dearer electricity for consumers the further north you live in the UK. Is the Minister aware of the continuing concerns in the, e the European Union about discrimination against energy producers by national grid, which has led to the early closure and huge job losses potentially at Longanet, and which also holds back the development of renewables in our part of the United Kingdom? Briefly, Minister. 
Uh, well, yes, I am. And indeed, he uh, uh, mentions uh, Europe and Commissioner Ottinger when he visited Scotland expressed the view that with our success in renewables, we would, with increasing interconnection, such as North Connect, such as the IELTS project, have, be, ha, have the capacity to be a European reserve for electricity. So it does appear that we have support from Brussels. What we now need is a little bit of positive support from London. Jackie Bailey, followed by Chick Brody. Can I say to the Minister, we are absolutely happy to work together and do everything in our power to sustain high quality jobs, but we need to see a plan. And despite a four minute answer, I'm no clearer about his proposal. This isn't about transmission charges and simply blaming that as the only issue is no substitute for having a plan. So can I ask him again, what is the Minister's plan? First, uh, Minister. Uh, well, of course, it is because of the higher costs and Scottish Power have set this out extremely uh, clearly. Scottish Power have incidentally, and I think it should be a matter of record, have invested £348 million in their plan. There have been attacks on that company from the Labour Party. I think those attacks are outrageous, uh, and I think it's a matter of record that this company has invested very substantially to deal with tackling the admissions uh, and in support of their plan, and continue so to do. Uh, as I have already stated, and perhaps Jackie Bailey it wasn't ingesting what I said. National Grid themselves have said when I met them last week, uh, and this was Mike Calview in London, this is perfectly possible that other arrangements can be made just as the contract was issued this week. And moreover, if as many experts who advise us believe uh, uh, that the, the uh, margin of 2% is parlous uh, are borne out, then they will have to make other measures in order to protect security of supply. Uh, for example, Sir John Armott, who advises the Labour Party, said, we are very close to being in a, in a crisis when it comes to energy. I have many more experts to quote, but it appears that the Labour Party do not agree even with their own experts who give them advice. Jake Brody, followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, President. Officer. This is a bad decision. I welcome the Minister's comment on his speech re cost, cost reduction proposals uh, with Restoration Coal. But if the proposal on cost reduction is rejected, I ask him what the unemployment impact may be of the proposed closure of Long Annet on the supply chain to Long Annet, particularly of the raw material of coal uh, in, in Ayrshire. And how can we enhance job opportunities through an accelerated balance mix of energy supply sources? Minister. Uh, well, I, I am working with uh, members of the Labour and Conservative Party in order to pursue the uh, opportunities that Chick Brody rightly describes and the work that we've done in the Open Cast Task Force most recently uh, on the 16th of March is, is, achieving this, is to achieve this end. Uh, we want restoration coal. We want Long Annet to be able to continue to be a market for that coal. Uh, and we believe that that will allow restoration of the mines in Scotland, uh, a terrific objective and one that we share. What I think we need, Presiding Officer, uh, to answer Mr Brodie's question, uh, is full support from the Labour and Conservative parties to our aim to avert the premature closure of Long Annet, along with, of course, the Liberals, perhaps from whom we're about to hear. Well, if any, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Um, can I thank the Energy Minister for an advanced copy of a statement? When I represented West Fife in the House of Commons, I repeatedly made the case for the plant to receive extra government support for CCS and other low emission measures. So it's a sad day for me that this has come about, but it was one that was known that would come once the finances for CCS did not stack up. It was clear that it was not a matter of with, when, sorry, but if. Um, so the priorities now should be to look after the workforce and to give them certainty, but also to have constructive discussions with the UK government and um, the energy network about the sustainable energy mix in Scotland. But as this issue has not been raised, one final matter. Um, are there consequences for the Stirling, Alloa and Kincardine railway line, which was um, built to try and supply the, the Long Annet power station? Is there going to be consequences for that as well? Minister. Uh, well, uh, I, I'm sure Mr Brown will, will respond specifically to that, but plainly a lot of money has been invested in that line on the basis of, uh, of Long Annet's requirements. 
And, uh, 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 of course, there are passenger services there to Alloa as well. Um, presiding officer, I do hope that from this, uh, this statement and the answers today, we can all pledge to do what we can to avert the premature closure of Long Gannett. This was an objective that I thought was one around which we could unite. It would be extremely sad. It would be extremely sad, I think, for Scotland and for the huge number of people who believe that Longanet has done, as it has done, a great job for Scotland and that it is necessary for several years yet if it could not enjoy cross-party support, at least from the major parties on this matter. I now have less than five minutes to get through a number of speakers, so uh, please keep them very brief. Kenneth Gibson, Cara Hilton. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister mentioned in his uh, statement those affected within the related supply chain. Uh, what, what assessment has he made of the impact of the closure of Langanet on the coal supply chain and, in particular, Hunterson Terminal, the Clyde Port facility uh, operated, uh, that operates coal handling located in my constituency? Minister. Uh, well, the, the impact would be very substantial. I mean, I can advise Mr Gibson, for example, that the estimated yield of restoration coal, were that to go ahead, would be 5 million tonnes in aggregate. Uh, that, that plainly would uh, serve to sustain the supply chain uh, in his constituency and other parts of Scotland. So there is more work to be done to consider what the impacts uh, of the closure of Langanet, where that to occur would be. And we will work closely with the existing task forces uh, and the Council to that end. But we would far prefer to avert that closure if we possibly can, and it is to that objective uh, that our efforts are directed. Cara Hilton, followed by Patrick Harvey. Um, as the constituency member for Long Island, this week's announcement has obviously been a bitter blow for the constituents, constituents I represent. Well, I too want to see every single option explored to keep Long Island open, given that 270 jobs are directly at threat and up to 1,000 more jobs are at risk throughout the supply chain and independent businesses in the local economy. Will the Minister back my call and the call made by Councillor David Ross, the leader of Fife Council, for a task force to be set up immediately to develop an action plan to protect the local community, to build up resilience to promote regeneration and to ensure that Concarden and West Fife are protected against the worst effects of a potential early closure of the site. Minister. Uh, well, the, the best way, if I, if I may say so, presiding officer, and with respect to the member, to protect her constituents uh, and others throughout the country is to prevent the premature closure of Long Gannett. Uh, uh, and that, that, is, uh, that is an objective which does not appear to be getting explicit support, sadly, from the Labour Party, the Conservative Party or the Liberal Democrats. And I don't think we're in any doubt what Mr Harvey is going to say in a minute. Uh, yes, of course, if it is necessary, uh, it, we will appoint any force that is necessary to tackle the consequences of closure. And indeed, I have already agreed with Councillor Ross uh, to co-chair a meeting bringing all stakeholders together. PACE is already in. They are already consulting Scottish power. Uh, but there is 12 months yet were it to close. Most task forces are appointed after closure or after redundancies. The task before us is to do everything we possibly can to prevent that eventuality from occurring. But of course, we work extremely closely with the uh, council leadership and uh, executive officers in Fife and we'll continue to explore with them everything possible that we can do in the interim. Patrick Harvey, followed by Nigel Dawn. I would be happy to see the government pursue any work to explore alternative economic future for the local area, something which should have been the priority for years rather than kidding people on that coal has a long-term future to it in this country. Does the Minister acknowledge, though, that even once Longana is gone, Scotland will be a net exporter of electricity due to the growth of renewables? Shouldn't that be the focus in terms of our energy policy and make sure the economic priorities are for alternatives for the community? Minister. Well, we are a net exporter. Uh, last year, we exported 28% uh, of energy uh, of our el electricity generated uh, from Scotland. Uh, we are and have been pursuing working with Fife Council, I may say, other opportunities uh, for economic regeneration in Fife. The, the premise Mr Harvey puts forward that we haven't been doing that is complete, complete nonsense. Just a couple of weeks ago, for example, after about a decade of work, 
uh, I was honoured to conduct the opening ceremony at the, the Mark Inch uh, plant, the new biomass plant, £300 million investment to which we contributed and which also sustains the future of Tullis Russell. A, a couple of weeks ago was RAF Lukers. I've also visited St Andrews. I've been, been visiting tourism uh, businesses in, in Fife. So, of course, we continue to explore all avenues for economic regeneration, including in the energy field, the, the oil and gas field, which Mr Harvey disapproves of, uh, and all other fields. Uh, but uh, it's a disappointment, presiding officer, than the statement that we haven't had explicit, statement, explicit support for keeping Longana open for the next several years, which is something that people out with this chamber strongly believe should happen. Nigel John, followed by Alex Rowley. Sir, I understand the First Minister wrote to the Prime Minister last month asking for a review of electricity supply and security of supply. I'm wondering whether we've had a reply yet, please. Minister. Well, you, Mr Don is correct. The, the First Minister, following a meeting of the Energy Advisory Board, with, uh, where the national grid was present and was involved in discussions, the First Minister expressed severe concerns to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister replied, uh, rejecting those concerns, stating that he backed National Grid and he has refused, therefore, to intervene. However, post May, the outgoing government may be replaced by another one, another one with a stronger Scottish voice in Westminster and one there where there will be an entirely different entirely different way in which Scotland's needs can be taken forward. Yeah. Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister confirm that current moratorium on fracking, which excludes underground coal gasification, was not in any way connected to a future plan for or consideration to diversify Longanet to a UCG plan when the original closure timescale of 2020 was reached? And can he confirm that neither he nor Scottish Government officials have had any discussions with INEOS or other parties regarding the use of Longanet as a potential UCG facility? Minister. I, I can confirm I've been involved in no discussions regarding those matters. Thank you. That ends the statement from the Minister. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 12776 in the name of Jackie Bailey on supporting Scotland's economy.